Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to the second segment of Finding Me in the ITV Networks. With me today is Dr. Funmi as we spoke about the leadership issues in the African continent, perceptions that influence it and how we need to change the narrative. But because our time is so limited and I really want to get into this whole issue of conflict, that Africa is riddled with conflict. And so many people take particular approaches to conflict, but my greatest concern is that very often history is neglected. Can you solve an issue of conflict, any conflict, because I mean we're seeing the repetition of it now in the Middle East without considering, con uh, without considering the historical context? No, no, I, I think really uh, any conflict whatsoever, anywhere in the world, Africa, the Middle East, uh, the rest of the world, we've seen what's happening also uh, in Ukraine uh, and so on we cannot possibly look at conflict and the resolution of conflict without looking at the root causes of conflict. That, that, that's, you know, it, okay, it, it, but it's the, one but of the, the key elements. But the ex-ambassador of, of Turkey has written a whole article on how to deal with the Islamic State problem. And he basically says that the U.S. should continue sending its missiles and bombing. And then, of course, they need to draw in NATO. And then the Iraqi government, together with the U.S. and NATO, should form a corridor to position troops, etc., to regulate or eradicate the jihadists, arrest anybody who indicates or shows an indication to want to be a jihadist, mm -hmm. and these kind of things. But my, my, my impression is that, okay, you'll wipe them out today, tomorrow there'll be a new generation. Mm -hmm. And so the conflict continues. And somebody like him specifically does not speak about the leadership in these countries and that the problem that the masses have with their puppet regimes. So, I mean, how do you then address this in terms of your understanding of conflict? No, no, let, let, let me focus on my own understanding of conflict and its management and the resolution. I haven't seen that paper itself, but even just listening to you, one of the, what is very clear is that the world most of the time is driven by an imperative to end violent conflict now. Uh, and in fact, the, the, the whole principle of uh, neutrality and impartiality. We, we can't always be neutral because, you know, we're always on the side of, you know, good or something that is not so good. People, you know, pitch there. But, but the whole notion of impartially looking at ending conflict has to take several dimensions, you know, uh, into, into doing that. Uh, as you recall, right after the Cold War, as the conflicts on the continent in Africa began to, uh, you know, escalate. escalate yeah. And you saw that in Liberia rapidly, uh, also in Somalia, Sierra Leone, and then Rwanda, which led to the genocide ultimately. You saw that the imperative was to just simply end the violence. And what I call the classical peace building dilemma is precisely that, that we spend all of this money on peace building missions or peacekeeping missions. Uh, sometimes a peace operation costs up to a billion, you know, at least half a billion US dollars. And then we return to the same place. A few years later. A few years later. And this recurrence of violence tells us that if we do not look at the underlying causes of conflict, what we're going to do is repeatedly go back to that place to simply do, you know, dress the wounds uh, and go back again. Uh, and if, if I were to apply this to the Middle East, uh, as into many other places, you can actually look at the, the conflict in Kashmir as well, uh, where Cyprus has been quiet, you know, was, but you had peacekeeping, a peacekeeping mission in, in, in Cyprus for how many decades uh, now? But if you apply that uh, notion to it, what it tells us is that every time we use violence only to resolve this conflict, we forget that in, there's a, a, a younger generation that is waiting and is observing all the atrocities in those conflicts. And the memory, the bitterness remains. And when that generation has the power again to right the wrong, uh, you know, we'll as it were, again. they start again. So unless we really think about how to transform the, you know, conflicts by dealing with the key issues at the root of conflict once and for all, we're likely to return to the same places or to have, or we're likely to have generations come again another day to try to take up those issues and they will go to war over them. So that brings me to an interesting comment which I saw yes. on Twitter where somebody responded and said that Hamas is basically all the young boys or the young people mm -hmm. who watched you bombing their parents' homes, killing them off, destroying their schools, amputating or, you know, leading to the disability of their friends or family, etc. And today they're fighting back. Mm -hmm. And so until this issue is not addressed as it should be addressed, yes. of course, there's going to be a new generation of, of fighters or liberation uh, struggles, basically. That is one example. 
it happens, uh, you can see that, you know, if you trigger so many examples, it happens almost everywhere. It will not surprise me that you find a new generation of uh, Palestinians who will still take up arms if some of these conflicts. And that's the key difference between conflict management and res resolution. We can manage conflict through ceasefire agreements. We can also try uh, to put different things in place to stop the violence. But the end of violence does not mean the end of conflict. The resolution of conflict itself will be, we can truly say that a conflict is resolved when all the bitterness associated with that conflict, all the emotional uh, anguish associated with that situation, you know, all of that has been truly erased. And I don't see many conflict situations where yeah. you can see that, you know, being truly erased, yeah, yeah. erased even for 400 years. The yeah. memory stays on. Which is strange because people talk about like, you know, that uh, get over it. It's been 20 years or it's been 40 years or 60 years yet. I see people still talking about the First World War. And they're talking about the Hundred Year War and things like that. And they're still carrying those emotions. So Absolutely. something that's in the recent past. And then you expect, yes. you know, uh, another no, no, people it, to overcome. No, no. In, in, in reality, really. Conflict does not get resolved in that way over long periods of time. I myself recall some, you know, in, in, in oral history terms, stories that parents and grandparents and sometimes great grandparents will tell, you know, tell their offspring. And people keep them and you remember them even, you know, when you least expect to remember them. When you see the people in question, the places in question, it triggers something in your memory. And I don't think we can underestimate that. That is why uh, it's important to think about true reconciliation and see reconciliation as a long, long process which requires a lot of hard work. Yes, it requires a lot of hard work, but I need to ask, are you optimist? Because I always feel that for conflict resolution, yes, it, yes it's, a, it's, a, it's a long process, but there's always power struggles there. And sometimes it's to the benefit of certain, uh, can I say, agents to ensure that the conflict continues in order to get or to achieve what it is that they want to achieve. So, Without a question, within a conflict environment and outside a conflict environment, there are always power dynamics. Uh, in pure, uh, what I'll call Galton terms, uh, if you look at this notion that at the roots, when you look at the foundations of peace, which is also where you find the root causes of conflict, you know, depending on you know, what that context offers. You see attitudes that are shaped by norms, values, uh, if you like, and beliefs, yes. which is what determines how we behave as human beings to one another. And again, we bring leadership into it and it comes in, in in different ways. Now, what determines whether or not we can behave, we can act on those attitudes, okay, is the amount of power we have in that context. If I have power over you, and I already believe that you're inferior to me, I'm likely to inflict a particular kind of damage psychologically, emotionally, and sometimes physically on you, okay? Mm -hmm. What determines at the end of the day whether or not I would do that and get away with it is the leadership context, as far as I'm concerned. How society has interacted with those values, okay, and what shapes it, and who has managed to assert influence in that space would say a lot. The power dynamics will come in. And if it's an external that is a certain influence in an internal conflict situation, if it always leaders, shows. Yeah. But if you have good leadership, you can overcome that. Yes, as if well. you have effective leadership in which, really, you know, just one more comment on this. The issue of mutuality is very important. If we believe that we're in this together, if we're collectively affected by a problem and we truly, genuinely want to resolve it, we will exchange influence and it leads us to a solution. But if we're not on the same page, which is, which is what I often believe about ruling elite and their people, yes. especially on the continent, okay? If ruling elite don't see themselves as experiencing the same thing as their people, don't feel those things and do not see these problems as something that is mutually shared with the peoples of that environment, uh, exchange is not being influenced there. It's not being, you know, influence is not being exchanged there. The real influence is coming from elsewhere. And I see on many occasions where uh, African leaders are exchanging influence with external leaders, external actors. And sometimes exchange influence with external actors, uh, you know, really against their own people. people. Okay, so we're almost at the final part yes, and absolutely. I have two important questions. The right. first one is most of my students say that there are enough African academics yes. uh, who are writing about Africa. So everybody or most people who write about Africa are from outside of Africa. Yes. How do you change that? 
I, actually, I think this is what you and I have in common a lot. I, I honestly believe that there's a lot of knowledge, in fact, the key knowledge that is going to help us transform the situation of Africa as far as peace and security is concerned, resides in Africa. When an external comes into an environment, unless it's an external that has engaged in that environment and has become an insider over a long period of time, I, I don't always see the mutuality there. Yes. Uh, and ethically, uh, you know, we can do what we do by the books as scholars and researchers. Uh, the fact of the matter is that we almost always have biases. Yes. Uh, and putting that, those biases aside is part of what we contend with. But I think African scholars have a responsibility to do right by Africa by researching with integrity, by putting knowledge on the table with integrity and, ex and exchanging, transferring that knowledge to the environment that where, where the knowledge can actually sh truly shift the situation. We do not have enough Africans studying peace and security issues uh, on the continent of Africa at this point in time. Okay, so and this is one of the things that I think we need to change by having more and more African scholars engage that space so that the narratives, we can have competing narratives that help us transform the environment. Okay, so now as a parting statement, because we're at yes, the end, yes. what is your future projection for Africa? Well, my future projection for Africa is that we will have more and more Africans who begin to generate knowledge about Africa, okay? And who begin to use that knowledge to transform the space, the terrain in which we're experiencing all this insecurity in Africa and apply actually the right values on leadership, which will be around integrity, uh, if you like, pursuit of excellence, which are all the values that we're talking about at the African Leadership Center. But certainly, respect for diversity in all its forms. These are all the issues at the root you know, of conflict that we're talking about. Okay, in such a way that we begin to use the values with uh, excellent knowledge that has been produced to transform the African space. I'm very optimistic about this. I see a lot of talented Africans around me all the time, and I think the future is bright for the continent. So with that, I have to say thank you very much, because I always like to end on a positive note, especially about Africa. Absolutely. And that's one of the ways to change the narrative, I think so. Thank so you. thank you, Filmi, for being with us. Fiyamani, Lawa, Assalamu Alaikum Warahmatullah.